Hello everyone, thank you for joining this session. My name is Philippe Mete and I will be presenting the Holium protocol, which is a protocol we've just open sourced. Before starting, we really want to thank the Linux Foundation for the organization of this uh, open source submit. So before jumping in, yeah, a, a few words about uh, who we are. Uh, my name is Philippe Metes, and I, I will leave the floor later on to Thomas, Thomas Chatenier. We're both um, engineers in, in computer science. Uh, we met a few years ago when we were uh, consultants and developers in, in the blockchain ecosystem. We've worked for a company in France called Blockchain Partner, which uh, has since then been acquired by KPMG. We've We've always loved pushing for innovation, so we always managed to dedicate some time to research and development, to participate in, in a few hackathons. And for example, we, we managed to put into production some, uh, uh, some projects around zero knowledge proof. Um, at the beginning of the year, we, we, we felt and we understood the need for a, a new open source protocol in, in data transformation. So that's when we, we left our position and co-founded a, a company called Polyphen to develop and actively support the ecosystem around wh what we will talk about today, the, the Holium protocol. So this session will be organized around three parts. Uh, first one being this presentation, which will last around for around 30 minutes. Uh, it will be followed by a, a live demo by, by Thomas. And then we will have time for a few minutes of uh, question and answer. Let's start then with, with the presentation. Presentation itself will be made into three, three main parts. Uh, a broad, a broad idea that uh, we are at the confluence of, of two macro trends, which uh, I will talk about, and then we'll try to uh, assemble and build uh, the, 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 the active design of the Holium protocol. So first part is, is about, sorry, uh, the, 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 the first macro trend, and I, I'd like to talk about uh, Web3. First long trail trend is about uh, data. It, it's about uh, what we do, what we use computers for, what we do with digital data, not at an individual scale, but uh, really together. Uh, in fact, as a species, how do we use data to collaborate? Do we even collaborate? With, uh, and, and so, you know, today, now that digital data uh, undeniably has the greatest potential to serve as a, a source of knowledge. How do we, at a high architectural level, create, share, uh, and store data? Uh, to answer this kind of questions, we, we, we could talk about Web3. Uh, and, you know, even if uh, the internet is larger than, than the web, even if uh, not all digital data has to go through uh, the internet, uh, at least it's a, it's a good starting point to, to address this topic. So let's have a very general approach of what Web3 is. You know, we, we called Web1 uh, later on the, uh, as a, a, an era of, uh, of information where people could, users could read uh, data from, from centralized server. Then we've seen the rise of uh, Web2, the Web2 era with uh, more, more uh, platforms oriented uh, networks where people could not only read, but also write data on these platforms. It's the era of wikis, of uh, WordPress blogs, of, uh, of Facebook. And now we more and more talk about Web3, uh, Web3 uh, ecosystem where, where applications allow users to not only read and write, but also we say that uh, the network themselves are the support of, uh, of execution. So uh, it's a, a, a general evolution. Um, let's see how we could define Web3 maybe in, in a little bit more details. Uh, we could ask one of the initiators of Web3, which is uh, maybe Gavin Wood, uh, one of the, the co-founder of, uh, of Ethereum. And what he says is that Web3 is an inclusive set of protocols to provide building blocks for application makers. And these building blocks take the place, uh, the place of traditional web technologies, but present a whole new way of creating applications. So uh, Web3 as a protocol, as a set of protocols to build 
applications. It's a, a very quite broad definition, but for sure, um, yeah, it, it's hard to define uh, uh, in terms of use cases what Web3 could be in the same sense as, um, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't know all those use cases yet at the age of web one we we couldn't predict the, the destiny of uh, of hyperlinks in fact so in a way this underlines the fact that uh, web3 could have the potential to become the the rightful successor to something as big as uh, as the web and, and web2 and maybe it could be easier to to draw a formal outline of uh, of web3 of what web3 is if we focused on shared technical characteristics of, uh, of these networks. Um, so to start with, we can say that uh, Web3 definitely uh, started with Bitcoin and blockchains, and we could pick three intertwined uh, characteristics that often make for uh, Web3 protocols. First one would be uh, the existence of decentralized and open networks. So uh, even if the web is essentially uh, decentralized, Web2 uh, conceptually was more uh, around centralized platforms. And so uh, Web3 is made of decentralized and also open networks where people can join in freely. Then uh, another characteristic is the existence of consensus algorithm. Uh, Bitcoin, the big novelty in Bitcoin was essentially uh, proof of work and the fact that uh, this kind of algorithm allowed tiers to, to achieve agreement. Uh, one of the most uh, important innovations is that uh, uh, yeah, the, this, uh, this kind of algorithm uh, allowed people to trust the network implicitly instead of having to trust explicitly each actor of, uh, of the network. And finally, a third uh, important characteristic could be uh, the, 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 the fact that these networks often are, are built with an embedded economic incentive that make that uh, these networks are not only peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized networks, but it, the, these incentives kind of make them uh, uh, kind of autonomous in a way. So, of course, these three things. Uh, lead to many other features like censorship res resistance, modularity. But in the end, yeah, maybe we could say that uh, the economist had it right in, in 2015 with, uh, with this cover. Uh, Web3 networks are essentially trust machines. And if we come back to this illustration, then of course it, it is important that uh, Web3 are not only about read and write, but also about execution. But most importantly, uh, what changes it, the, 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 the nature, it's of the quality of what is stored of data uh, and which is different. Uh, now data on these networks, uh, it verifies open and transparent rules which are embedded uh, in, the, in the networks. So what changes is the, the, the trustworthiness of, uh, of data. Okay, let's step back a little from yeah all the the hype around number of Web three projects, and it, it could be useful to try to extract some key primitives uh, out of the these projects. So it, it's hard to do; it's a, a choice of mine. But uh, yeah, we we can see that a lot of projects are around uh, value transfer of value, uh, like the original blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain. We can then have a number of projects about uh, uh, making the, the, the global computer, like, uh, like Ethereum. Uh, I think there's interesting projects around uh, identity uh, with the Ethereum name service, for example, uh, with the rise of self-sovereign identity. And one of the key primitives we'll mostly focus on today is about storage, uh, in particular, uh, with the whole IPFS stack. So that's one of the key primitive. IPFS stack is a very modular stack, and we, we will try to study it briefly, uh, building it from bottom layers to the, the highest layers to see briefly how, how it kind of works. So first, first part of the stack would be uh, lib P2B, which is uh, the core of IPFS. It's a modular networking stack that 
that makes it easier to build robust P2B um, networks. Uh, these functions include um, discovering nodes, connecting nodes, discovering data and transferring data, things like, things like that. Uh, on top of that, you get multi-formats, uh, which holds uh, a collection of uh, hash algorithms and self-describing formats of methods. Um, and that, that, that makes the whole system more interoperable and uh, upgradable. Then you get IPLD for, for linked data. Uh, it holds data models that help traversing and connecting uh, blocks data through through content identifiers. It's basically a, a, middle, a middleware that uh, unifies uh, different block structures. Obviously, uh, IPFS, which is the, the distributed storage and transmission protocol. And on top of that, the, the, the highest layer of the stack would be Filecon, the, the economic uh, incentive layer where, uh, you know, miners could, would earn, miners earn Filecon to, by, by providing open uh, hard drive space to the network while users spend Filecon to, to store data on it. So really it's a, it, it's a modular stack. Con conceptually, we, we can say it's, it's a beautiful stack. It's one of the most beautiful way of storing digital we've, we've ever had. And so next question would be one, one may ask why would we use these networks or why would we what what what, what kind of data would we store on them and and that is a, a valid question you know uh, uh we are living in an era we've we where aws s3 is very efficient for static storage ranks for example uh information sometimes needs to be stored in in databases that are super efficient at uh, what they do so that that's a valid question and we on one side we have a beautiful uh, object but that's a valid question and and so we we don't want to play with the hype but uh fact is we we definitely already live in a world of data driven decision and and it, it is undeniable that that uh, uh, this trend we will most certainly keep on increasing and so if we look at uh, the, the you know the exponential amount of data we we manipulate the the market value of big data companies like, like snowflake the the number of uh, uh, services we can create when once data sets are publicly released like uh, uber with google map and uh, superhuman with uh, the gmail api when you look at uh, simply put the 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 continuing hype of um, of uh, uh, artificial uh, artificial intelligence then in the end uh, what what better way is there to to store uh, share data collaborate and bring this world to life and turn this hype into a reality than with web3 protocols and the ipfs stack in particular um so that's basically the, the first macro trend that I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's something, well, these web three protocols, something it, that is quite like close to our hearts. And, and you know, we, we may do it for ethical reasons, like our noble predecessors in the, in the 60s. But yeah, in the end, you don't even have to do it for ethical reasons. Uh, fact is, we want build the best AI. We want unlock the best data-driven decisions. We won't be the best post-computing civilization if we don't share the raw resource, if we don't share the data. And uh, yeah, of course, competition is good sometimes or, or most of the times, but uh, it stops to be once uh, it restrains innovation. And why would we rely on GAFAM to build the future of AI? Why would we delegate our, our right for innovation to locked in platforms? And so simply put, we think that it's time to foster competition on what we do with data and not anymore on who owns data. Uh, another way of phrasing it would be let's yeah, let's delete the data rent by making its quest quest sorry obsolete. Um and yeah, in the end it's not even the like to delete the data rent in, in itself, which is uh, which is quite a political goal, but we 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 have to do it to unlock innovation to do better AI, which is uh, way more consensual, obviously. Yeah, so that was the the first big macro trend. 
I'll talk about the, the second one, which is more at a, at a more practical level about architectural patterns in, in the domain of uh, data integration and, and yeah, their, their level of openness. Why, why focusing more on data integration? First, first reason, because in, in terms of collaboration, it intersects with a number of our interests. Uh, because uh, the purpose of uh, data integration is to combine data that resides in, in different heterogeneous uh, sources to provide a, a unified, coherent view of them. Uh, secondly, because in commercial domains, uh, you know, the explosion of the, the, the amount of data generated and the rise of uh, service-oriented architectures made research in data integration techniques uh, quite vital for uh, for business information so that is indeed indeniably indeniably sorry one of the fields where most innovation happened even if uh, there's still quite some uh, open problems that remain unsolved so well what we can see in the evolution of uh, common stacks here on this diagram is that components are getting more and more service oriented which is quite prone to, to interaction, to more collaboration. Since, uh, since the release of Redshift in 2012, we've seen the rise of uh, uh, modern data warehouses and the emergence of uh, an ecosystem of cloud native adjacent technologies. Uh, in the years 2014, 2016, the, the ETL for extract, transform, load pattern has become extremely popular thanks to these cloud services and now it's moving forward toward, towards more ELT uh, patterns where transformation tools like DBT play a quite prominent role. So yeah, how, how, how could we explain the popularity of uh, ELT pattern? Um, definitely the, the main reason lies in the power of uh, modern data warehouses, which got so performance and scalable that, that it's now become uh, possible to run data transformations in database rather than rather than in uh, external data processing uh, layers uh, le, 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 yeah the, the typical data stack today uh, could be synthesized like that with uh, data sources like many database databases postgresql services also like uh, uh, adwords uh, apis facebook apis um, it's followed by uh, integration services like, like Fivetran, Segment, uh, open source solutions like Airbyte. All data uh, ends up in, in, a data, in your data warehouse like Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift. And, and, and on top of that, you get a transformation tool, which is almost certain, certainly a DBT. You, you may have a, a reverse ETL tool like Census and High Touch, and in the end, uh, your business intelligence service, uh, Looker, Mode, Redash. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when we look at that, we easily understand the, the importance of DBT. DBT sits on top of your data warehouse, and its only role is to take code, compile it to SQL and, and to SQL and, and, and run it. Uh, so it, that makes DBT essentially the T in uh, in ELT, and it does not extract or load data, but it is perfectly suited to transform data that's already located in in your warehouse. But this model has limits. It has built-in limits, uh, and these limits are, are clearly identified. Uh, you know, DBT only works with SQL, and that's one of the strengths of uh, current ELT stacks. Uh, it's that all components speak the same language, which is, which is SQL, but it's also one of their limits. Uh, they have to heavily uh, rely on models, and they can only transform tr structured data. So what about semi-structured data? What about complex data? Uh, DBT is uh, unable to, to, to process them, and that's a, a clearly identified limit. Uh, the, the team behind DBT clearly analyzes it, and, and it's, yeah, they say that it's uh, quite frustratingly, they, they think that there's no great solution today. Even Bob Muglia, the, the former CEO of Snowflake, uh, 
he also acknowledges this, uh, this limitation and and publicly wishes for a solution to be introduced in, in the near future. You know, what is missing is the support for complex data. Uh, could you could you imagine if you could transact fully transact all types of uh, data like images, videos, and things? Uh, together with any source of semi-structured semi data in a, in a data warehouse and he thinks that this is going to come in the next two or three years that was uh, a year ago and that is precisely the the, the problem we we want to solve with holium we want to handle the t in elt for not only structured but also semi-structured and uh, and complex data and we think that yeah the this is what we need to unlock not only business intelligence but but a broader intelligence and that sits on top of data warehouses and data lakes and conceptually you know what wider data lake could it be than ipfs and this is where our two trends come together first one being able to to transform complex data to create performant generic elt flows and then connecting it to one of the most beautiful and uh, 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 universal data storage network we, we've ever had to, to build a, a future-proof uh, data stack. So yeah, that, that's, that was uh, the second kind of macro trend. Uh, and logically, the question now is, uh, how do we do that? Uh, what kind of architecture can we, can we design to do that? And that brings us to the third and final part of uh, this presentation, where we will try to assemble uh, part of the part of the part this uh, Holium protocol. So we will progressively build the Holium protocol in, in three steps uh, that will help us get progressively a larger and larger picture of uh, how it works. We're going to compare Holium to DBT. Uh, on three aspects, uh, the three three you can see there. And so all these issues, uh, you know, they, they tie in with each other and make up for the complete design of the solution. But the first one uh, we can focus on is uh, the execution environment of uh, transformation. So for DBT, uh, transformations are held in database. Uh, they are based uh, on, on SQL. And in our case, we want transformation that could be written in many languages. Uh, and ideally, we, we, we don't even want to try to, we, we don't even want to restrict the, the number of languages uh, we want to support. We, we need to only unify their mode of execution to, to make them kind of interoperable and to make them individual modular elements of uh, pipelines. Thus, we, we just simply use a, a containerization solution. Conceptually, it could have been a Docker, but in, in 2021, we, you know, we, we can take advantage of uh, WebAssembly, which, uh, which first version was finalized by uh, W3C uh, in late 2019. In, in terms of contain, containerization, uh, WebAssembly is both lighter, more portable, more secure, uh, it offers uh, native, quite uh, almost native performance for for compiled languages, and in terms of pipeline platform, uh, it, it, it offers quite interesting characteristics like uh, replayability, scalability, reliability, uh, security. It's quite more secure than, than Docker, and these all are uh, essential um, uh, pipeline design principles. So we, we've got this execution environment and we also need to define what is executed in this uh, environment to, we need to standardize the interface between two steps of a pipeline. Uh, you know, the, the role that was played by uh, SQL models in dbt. So for the sake of brief, briefty, uh, we will oversimplify and essentially we can say that all transformations uh, are our atomic transformation that take one JSON input parameter and return one JSON object. Uh, there's uh, a light wrapper, this uh, IO data translator, which is responsible for mapping the field of all these JSON objects to actual variables 
in uh, in original transformations. Uh, but but simply put, that's uh, that's as, as simple as that. So you know, in this example, we have a a, a, a function that could be written in Rust that's responsible for computing uh, the, the the performing the Euclidean uh, division, and yeah, we we would hand over a JSON object with a dividend uh, field and a divisor field, and the atomic transformation, if successful, would only return another object with uh, with two other fields for for quotient and and remainder. So yeah, uh, first answer uh, would be that each step uh, of a pipeline would be a, an atomic transformation that runs inside a, a WebAssembly runtime. Now we get to see how the chaining of these transformations could be defined. And, and you know, in dbt, there's, uh, you can use Jinja variables that, that can play a, a, an important role in, in this mission. Um, Simply put, the, the problem is that to enable chaining, we don't want to attach any key to data objects used as, as input output parameters of transformations. Uh, data that uh, in, in fact serve as uh, the only interface between two transformations. So we consider all keys to be contextual information, to be only semantic information. For, for example, here on, on this slide, uh, 462 in this example is used as a, a divisor in this uh, Euclidean division, but once stored at rest, it's only 462. It may be used as something else uh, that, uh, than a divisor in, a, in another transformation, and we, it will still be the same 462. It will still be the same value in substance. So context may seamlessly be attached or detached, detached sorry, later on. This this is why we define a deterministic way to translate, uh, to, to transform uh, JSON maps into arrays and vice versa by removing keys. And, and, and that, that's what we called Holium JSON. And uh, furthermore, we, we don't, we don't uh, really use JSON. We use a, a binary version of it called, uh, called Cibor. And so that brings, it, brings us to uh, the format we mainly use in our protocol, which is a, uh, which is wholly on CBOR, a simplified uh, a subset of uh, of CBOR. If you come back to this diagram, then uh, at the interface, uh, at the boundaries of the execution environment, you don't have uh, these full JSON objects, but only uh, simplified wholly on CBOR uh, arrays uh, that hold uh, the most important part of uh, the information. So yeah, you, you get these atomic transformations that you could use to run, for example, the, the Euclidean uh, algorithm to, to, to find uh, the greatest common divisor. Uh, here, dividend, divisor are contextual informations, uh, but you know, all input, output, fields, subfields, sub subfields have precise index numbers. And so uh, what it means is that Creating pipeline, pipelines basically means connecting all inputs to preceding outputs. And that's basically what we do. Pipelines are as simple as these connections between, uh, between Holium Cibor index numbers. And that's how we define pipeline. Yeah. Finally, sorry, uh, let, let's study the, 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 the case for storage and, and storage of all this information, data, metadata. Um, in, in DBT, you know, you, all, all information is uh, stored on a centralized data warehouse, but in Holium, we, we, we can see uh, how data could be shared and, and stored at, uh, at the lowest level. So essentially, we, we hold scalar and recursive data, scalars and arrays. And what we think is that any piece of data should be uniquely identifiable, whatever the context, that uh, its ID should be enough to access the data. And that's the reason why the Holium protocol uses uh, what are called content identifiers, CIDs, and content addressing. CIDs are based on uh, cryptographic hashes uh, of the content, and, 
uh, any difference, any small difference in the content will produce a, a different CID. And uh, the same content will always uh, produce the exact same CID. Uh, and, and we use content addressing to identify content by uh, what's in it rather than uh, on its location. So in this context, scalar values are stored as they are and recursive values only link to other values through these cryptographic hashes. And that is true, uh, not only for integers, but uh, integers we've seen up until now, but also for other types of data like floats, uh, text and byte strings, uh, but also transformation byte code and pipeline. They all use this CID, they all use linked data, and they all can ultimately be safely stored and shared through through the IPFS stack. So that's the last question to to the, the last answer sorry to to our questions yeah so that's basically how the the holium protocol uh, achieves I its mission that's also the the end of uh, this part of the presentation uh, the design and all the specs uh, of this protocol have been uh, open sourced as well as a cli to start using it uh, then uh, I will hand it over to, to Thomas for a live demo of, uh, of this CLI. Thank you. Hey everyone, Thomas here. Thank you, Philippe, for the presentation of the theory around the Holium protocol. I will now try to demonstrate the implementation uh, as in the form of a CLI that we did of the protocol. Um, that should help you to create your data pipelines and make them run. So first things first, I will show you the subcommands that we have at your disposal in our CLI. So they are all quite linked to objects that Philip already presented. So we have here the pipeline command, well, for pipeline, run, and also management. We have the transformation command, which you can use to add new transformation and manage transformation inside of the pipeline. Connection to connect those transformation. Data to import data manually. And we have also portation here, which I won't get into detail now, but will automate uh, the import and the export of a uh, of data from a pipeline when you run it on your file system, just to help you around that. Okay. As other command, we also have the init command here. Well, that's the first thing you should use when actually building a Holium project on your machine. For myself, I already used it because I wanted to have some materials ready for the demo. So if I do ls here, I can see that I have uh, that Holium folder, and if I export that, I can see that I have three files, gitignore for the VCS, two config files, which can be used, for example, to uh, specify that you don't want to use data version control, DVC, or some stuff like that, and two folders. First one is cache for optimization and performance, and objects that will contain all your objects, such as data, transformation, pipeline, or portation, or connection. So now let's say that I want to build a pipeline. Well, the pipeline that I want to build myself is a case that I found on Kaggle, which is an ETL basic case of data cleaning and completing. So the idea is that I have this data set here, which is a project data. And in that project data, which comes from the World Bank, I've shortened it to only 10 lines. So it goes a bit faster in terms of import, etc. But I want to remove the last column, which has no purpose, which is called column one, which is empty here. And I want to add another column, which is uh, the country name, which has been uh, reformatted because you can see here, it's kind of strange. I have a semicolon and there's two iteration of the country name. And also I want to add the country uh, code, just you know for later possibilities to have maybe it uh, a bit clearer. So to do so, the first thing first, maybe what I want to do is actually import a new transformation because I already have two of them that I can show you. So this transformation, what they do is the first one will actually uh, drop the column as I showed you, that I showed you, and the other one will reformat the country name to have it to uh, add it grid, uh, in a grid format, sorry. So the transformation that I want to add is here. It's coded in Rust. We have a SDK in Rust to actually compile our code to a um, proper, proper, sorry, wasn't bytecode. And so what it does is it takes CSV data, adds a new 
column here, which is called country code. And then thanks to the select scrapes, it will use the country name to generate the country code and push it into the column, uh, into the recall, sorry, to explain the CSV data. So what I can do is use the REST SDK uh, command line to compile it. In my case, to have a shorter demo time, I've already done it and it's prepared. So let's actually go to a uh, our command line here and we can actually import our um, transformation and its metadata. The metadata is also produced when um, compiling the transformation. And we will be able to see when I inspect it why are metadata important. Metadata, what they do is they specify thanks to JSON schema, so they specify in JSON object format all of the transformation information. So the name here, so the entry point when I was in bytecode, and it also have the inputs, so CSV data in my case, which is an array of array of string, and the outputs, which is also the same type. So thanks to that, uh, anybody that actually receives the pipelines or check out the pipelines can see all the information of the different processes inside of the transformation. Now that I have my transformation, I'll be able to check my list of transformation inside of, um, sorry, small, pro small issue with my machine. I'll be able to check inside of the transformation list that I have three transformation here. And now I want to connect those two, right? Because there is the last two of my uh, iPad. So to do so, what I can do is use the connection uh, subcommit. So to, co to connect different transformation, what I want to use is their hash, but also their uh, ports here. So what I'm saying here is that I want to connect my parent here, which uh, creates a new column country name with formatted country name inside of it. And I'm saying that, okay, take all the column that is outputted, the format is the same as this one. So take all the columns, so headers and also um, data, and put everything inside the inputs here of my um, last transformation. So I specified here sub index, but I, I shouldn't really be obliged to do so because if I would have just put zero, it would have worked, but it was just to showcase to you how you actually uh, can write down ports and how it can work. So let's create that connection. And here, if I inspect it, oops, sorry, connection inspect with the correct hash, I'll be able to check here that I have a parent, my child, and the mapping. That's pretty cool. Now we have the our entire pipeline, which is ready. If I put on my data, it should work right. So I need to import my data inside of my uh, CLI. My, sorry, my project. So how do I do that? There's two ways. The first one would be to specify a source folder and add a portation, an importer, automatic importer to import my data. Also add a result folder, which would be used at the end of my pipeline to output CSV or JSON or the format that I specified inside of the result folder. And another way of adding data is also import it manually. So I can do that with the data subcommand. So if I use the data subcommand and import the CSV that I showed you earlier, I'll be able to get a hash of my data. So that's the hash of my CSV. And if I look at it, I might, at my data list, you might think, okay, well, so we have the hash of the, CS the CSV, we have that, but we also have the hash of all the underlying data because we fragment it to granular uh, pieces. So we optimize storage space inside of the machine. So now I have my data imported. So that's the first way. We'll be able to use it later on. I'll show you how. But we want also to add, to add portation, to have automatic importers and exporters. So to do so, it works kind of like transformations because we want to, people to be able to share and use different importers and exporters quite easily. So in our case, I will add an importer, which will take a CSV file and produce it in the data type so that we can see inside of uh, transformations. All transformations take the exact same input and output the exact same type as I've showed you earlier. So an array of an, of an array of string. So now that I've added my importer, what I can do is actually uh, add the portion. So add the, the way of import. So what I'm saying here is, okay, take the data 
folder, use it as a source, pass it into my transformation, and you have to know that the data is of type CI, CSV, um, in, as an input. So let's add that, and if I inspect that correlation, I'll be able to check that, well, it's an importer, what is the source, and which transformation it is running. Here, directory path, transformation, type importer. That's nice. Now let's add an exporter. So for an exporter, what I want to export uh, my data uh, to is a CSV file. So I'll add my exporter and also add my um, results here. So what I'm saying is use the, um, oops, sorry, wrong hash here. So what I want to say is use the exporter that I uh, just added. And now um, put the results inside of, oh, my bad, wrong one. Put the results inside of uh, results here, which is ready already ready in my environment. So now what I can do is just run the pipeline. So to run the pipeline, again, I had two types of data imported manually and automatically. So if I want to add my my manual data in it, I can use my hash here of my data, which is the hash from my CSV. And so do an Olium pipeline run of my data because it takes a CSV as an input. And once I've run that, so I've run my three transformations, drop, uh, reformat the country name, add data code. And I can see that I have all my data here, which is ready. So if I do a Holium uh, data list, you can see that my data has been added correctly and the data list has grown. Now I want that data to be able to, to be readable, sorry, for human eyes. So I will run it, but not with uh, manual data, but with actual uh, importers, automatic importers and automatic exporters. So now if I check my results, I'll be able to find the CSV. Yep, here I have my CSV. And now you can see that inside of my CSV, I've dropped the column, which doesn't exist anymore. I've added the reformatted uh, country name and also with their country code. So that's all for me. Uh, I've shown you a basic usage of our CLI to use an ETL classic case of data cleaning and expanding. So, well, I hope that in, it, it, uh, it was clear for you. Um, I hope to meet some of you later on or discuss uh, some, with some of you later on about that and to get your feedback on what could be improved. Um, I will give the mic back to Philippe so that he can talk to you about the next step of our protocol. And I'll see you around, everyone, and have fun at OSS. Bye-bye. Thank you for this live demo. A few last words. Uh, you know, from, from the beginning, we've designed this protocol, uh, thinking of it as a, an open source project. So uh, we've just released everything on GitHub. You'll find all useful links. Um, uh, like specifications, documentation, or the GitHub, the Discord, uh, online on holium.org. Uh, we are actively working on development parts like uh, integration. We want to create bridges to other components of the ecosystem, both in to, to develop and run uh, pipelines. We, we are also actively uh, building more extensive uh, user interfaces, um, uh, a graphical uh, graphical interface as well as more data as code uh, oriented interface and, and you know one last part which is quite important is that um, in terms of protocol we it can always be improved and so uh, anyone can right now open and track what we call Holium improvement uh, proposals online. So again thank you very much for for your attention uh, and thank you again to the Linux Foundation for the organization of this great event. Thank you.